This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. One rainy night in upstate New York, 16-year-old Carrie Lynn Nixon ran an errand to a nearby store. Only 200 yards from her front door, she mysteriously vanished. That same summer, Carrie Lynn was spotted in South Carolina, but by the time her parents arrived, she was gone. In 1937, a man named Doc Noss explored secret underground caverns in a New Mexico mountain called Victoria Peak. He claimed to have found 79 skeletons and a vast treasure of gold, rare coins, and jewels. Many believe that the treasure still exists and today may be worth nearly $2 billion. In the winter of 1985, Dexter Stefanik embarked on a long trip from his son's farm in Oregon to his home in Wisconsin. At a desolate Montana rest stop, police discovered Dexter's car torched by an arsonist. Dexter had vanished. The nice cases feature ordinary people thrust into a vortex of mystery, heartbreak, and intrigue. Each one is searching for that vital clue to end a story that so far has no ending. Perhaps you can help. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. Buried treasure, the very words have a mythic ring. And such cases are usually a fascinating mixture of truth and fiction, fantasy and reality. Tonight, the legend of a vast treasure buried in underground caverns beneath a New Mexico mountain. Today, that treasure may be worth nearly $2 billion. People say it was discovered more than 50 years ago by a man named Doc Nars and his wife, Babe, who stood by him even though some thought he was a con man. Babe died in 1979. But part of our story tonight is a previously untelevised interview with her, graciously made available by her family. Is the treasure that Babe and Doc Noss discovered an elaborate scam? Or is it real? You be the judge. White Sands, New Mexico, 100,000 acres in the desolate Embryo Basin. It is an inhospitable environment home only to rattlesnakes and sagebrush, vultures and mule deer. In November of 1937, a man named Doc Noss was deer hunting there. He hiked to the top of a hill known as Victoria Peak. The women stayed at camp and the men went out for deer. And so in that first day hunt, Doc was up on a mountain to see where if he could find any springs or anything and he discovered an entrance to something. He lifted up a rock that was covering this, and uh, there was a big puff of air hit him right in the face that he'd found something, somebody's uh, old mine or something there, but he didn't know what it was. Inside the opening was a crude ladder. When Doc Noss inched his way down, step by step, into the mountain, he uncovered a vast, unexplored labyrinth. He went deeper and deeper. Narrow, winding tunnels led into a vaulted cavern. In one chamber of the cavern, Doc found an old chest. On the lid were the words, sealed silver, written in old English script. This chest was only the tip of an iceberg. The entire treasure is today estimated to be worth $1.7 billion. Even now, 
more than 50 years later, it may still be hidden beneath the craggy slopes of Victoria Peak. Doc Noss had been a traveling medicine showman. In 1933, he married Ova Beckwith, whom he nicknamed Babe. They settled down and opened a foot clinic in Hot Springs, New Mexico. Doc was my grandfather, and I've heard incredible stories about him all of my life. He loved adventure and um, was fascinated with history. Babe was very strong-willed. Ardent might be a word to describe her. She was loving, very generous, and absolutely um, enamored with Doc. There it is. Yeah? From the moment Doc discovered the treasure at Victoria Peak, he and Babe spent every free moment exploring the tunnels that led deep inside the mountain. Be careful. You be careful down in there. Yeah, I'm going down in, and, and you keep a, a, go, a close eye out here. Well, Doc found that the passageways in the mountain led to several caverns, and in one of them, he found 79 human skeletons stacked in a small enclosure. In another cave, Doc found amazing riches, jewels, coins, and priceless artifacts. He described uh, three huge uh, oval top chests that he opened. He brought a couple of swords and knives out. He brought out a crown, and I cleaned it up in my sink in, in town. It was 243 diamonds and one pigeon blood ruby in this crown. In a deeper cavern, Doc found what appeared to be a stack of worthless iron bars this must have been in the spring of 39. I asked him to bring out a bar, that pig iron that he was telling me about. And uh, he said, no, that is too heavy here, it's too hard to get out of there. But he found a small one and he brought it out. And he said, this is the last one of them babies I'm gonna bring out. There it is, babe. Watch it, it's heavy. Heavy? Pig iron? Well, Doc, that is heavy. When I rolled it over, I seen it was shiny where it hit the gravel. I said, well, Doc, this is yellow. Look at it. And he looked at that, and the sun was right at the right hour to shine right down on it. He rubbed his head, and he said, well, babe, if that's gold and all that other is gold like it, we can call John D. Rockefeller a tramp. Doc told Babe that inside the cavern, there were as many as 16,000 bars of gold. How had this enormous treasure come to be deep inside the caverns of Victoria Peak? There are four theories. It could have belonged to Juan Oñate, the man who founded New Mexico as a Spanish colony. Reportedly, Oñate had amassed an Aztec treasure of gold, silver, and jewels. Another theory is that a Catholic missionary named Father LaRue operated gold mines near Victoria Peak in 1797 and stored his gold in a cavern there. Doc's treasure could have belonged to Maximilian, the emperor of Mexico in the 1860s. He attempted to get his wealth out of Mexico when he learned of an assassination plot and legend says he sent a palace full of valuables to the United States. A final theory is that the treasure belonged to an Apache tribe which had raided stagecoaches carrying California mined gold. In the spring of 1938, six months after Doc Noss had made his discovery, he and Babe went to Santa Fe to establish legal ownership of his find. Good afternoon. Could I help you, sir? Yeah, we need some information on filing a claim. Just what type of claim? Uh, mining. Mining. Oh, okay, now just whereabouts do you need this claim located? They filed a lease with the state of New Mexico for the entire section of land surrounding Victoria Peak. Subsequent to that, they filed mining claims on and around Victoria Peak. 
we'll have that surveyed for you, or you can have it surveyed, and we'll determine the exact location of your claim. We'll uh, take care of that survey. We'll get somebody up there to survey that. They then filed a treasure trove claim, which has become the historic Noss family claim to the treasure in Victoria Peak. Over a period of two years, Doc mined the peak. Witnesses say he took more than 200 gold bars out of the cavern. He then proceeded to hide the bars from everyone, including his own family, not only because he feared theft, but also because back then it was illegal to own gold that was not in the form of jewelry. They were rehidden in a variety of locations all over the desert, some uh, right by the county roads by uh, a certain marked telephone pole. Some were dropped in horse tanks at the nearby ranches. Some were just buried in the sand, uh, and Doc would put a different colored rock over the top of it uh, than was natural to that surrounding. There was a lot of fear and probably some increasing paranoia in both Doc and Babe, because as they solicited more help from more friends and neighbors and supporters, they started to become afraid that some of these people might try to steal some of the bullion that they had rehidden around the peak. Finally, in the fall of 1939, Doc decided to try opening a larger passageway into Victoria Peak. So he hired a mining engineer by the name of Montgomery to go with him and help him dynamite out of the way a particularly huge boulder that was just sort of hanging in the lower portion of the shaft. Doc and uh, Montgomery was arguing very viciously about the charge to be put in there. Doc said that the mountain was rotten and that it wouldn't take a charge like that. And this Montgomery kept yelling it would. By the way, he got eight bars for doing it. The blast caused a cave-in which collapsed the fragile shaft. Doc had shut himself out of his own mind forever. Now, instead of having thousands of gold bars to draw from, he only had those few dozen or hundred or so that he had brought to the surface, and he became very protective of those bars. For nine years, Doc Noss attempted illegally to sell his gold bars on the black market. In 1948, he met a man named Charlie Ryan and struck a deal to sell him 51 of the bars. I could go for that. It would take me a couple days to get my cash together, but uh, how about a week from today? Let's do it. At the last minute, Doc feared that Charlie Ryan would double-cross him. He asked an acquaintance, Tony Jolly, to help him rebury the gold in a new hiding place. And we got in the pickup, and we went out across the desert, quite a long ways, and we started digging, and we dug 20 bars of gold out of the ground right there. And I said, Doc, I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I, there's a fellow coming tomorrow that's going to fly in here, and he said, he was supposed to take this gold and sell it and split with me. And he said, I uh, got word that he's going to sell it and keep right on going with the money. And we reburied those bars of gold. It turned out to be 90 more. I handled and I saw 110 bars of gold. The next day, Doc and Charlie Ryan got into an argument, and Ryan pulled a gun on him. Ryan accosted him and said they better discuss this problem of what had happened to the gold. Ryan was actually telling him, if you don't tell me where the bars are, you won't leave this room alive. You're just trying to jack up the price on me. This is just a hoax. There's no gold. I told you we couldn't trust him, Charlie. I told you that. God, just a con man, Charlie. He's going for his gun. It's in his truck. Shoot him. Shoot! Doc 
died instantly and was photographed by police where he lay. The date was March the 5th, 1949. For three years, Babe Noss and her children struggled to clear the passageway to the treasure. In 1952, when they were less than 12 yards from the opening to the central cavern, disaster struck again. The state of New Mexico was forced to relinquish Victoria Peak and the land surrounding it, so the United States Army could expand the White Sands Missile Range. Babe and her family were forced off their claim by the Army. What are y'all doing on our claim? Miss Noss, this is a missile range. It's unsafe for you to be up here. She was eventually escorted off the site by military police and federal marshals. But I sure don't like it. Protesting all the time that she did not want to abandon her claim, she wanted to continue her excavation work. I do it myself. I don't need She was assured that she would be able to return to the site as soon as it was convenient and not an interference to national security. My grandmother continued to petition the Department of the Army at White Sands Missile Range level and Pentagon level, asking for permission to go back and conduct a proper excavation to reopen the treasure cavern. She was repeatedly, continually, and consistently denied access to the peak. Interestingly, some of the personnel from Holloman Air Force Base and White Sands Missile Range inadvertently stumbled into a cavern on Victoria Peak and reported finding a room stacked full of gold bullion. The area that Victoria Peak is located in was 100% off limits to everybody in those days. Using hunting as a excuse, we wandered into the area quite regular. After spending a lot of time, a lot of weekends in this area, we found the entrance lower on the mountain that we suspected was there. We started digging. We spent August and September in this hole. In a large blockage was a very large boulder that we had to tunnel under that led into the first uh, room that we discovered. In the middle of this room was two stacks of material, and they were bars of something. And as we scratched it, we knew right away that it was actually gold. We marked and identified one of the bricks inside with my initials on it, and we stood it on end on the large piles. We then discovered another small room that was off uh, to the side of the room we were in. It was a bit smaller in size. In the middle of this room was a pile in a pyramid shape. Well, the reason that we didn't bring anything out of the mountain on our first visit to the cavern was simply because uh, we were military. We were in the middle of a top secret missile range that was uh, forbidden to everybody to be in. The last thing in the world we wanted to do was to jeopardize our position and our find by removing something prematurely. Eventually, the airmen informed their superiors about the gold they had found at Victoria Peak. They were denied permission to explore further, so they took steps to ensure that no one else could salvage the treasure. The following weekend, we returned to the entrance, and we dynamited it in four different places and blasted the whole thing shut. Over a year later, the Secretary of the Army created a top secret classified military operation at Victoria Peak. In 1961, Babe Noss, along with the state of New Mexico, filed an injunction against the Army to stop them from excavating at Victoria Peak. She was protesting vehemently that the Army would be excavating on her claim while they were denying her access to do the same thing. 
In 1963, the Army sought exclusive rights to Victoria Peak, including mineral rights. The state of New Mexico denied the Army's request. Even so, aerial photographs showed a proliferation of roads crisscrossing the peak. Word of Doc's hidden gold leaked to other treasure hunters. An anonymous group hired Boston attorney F. Lee Bailey. They were seeking permission from Attorney General John Mitchell, both to excavate at Victoria Peak and to sell gold bars. The secret of the gold became public at the Watergate hearings when John Dean testified about F. Lee Bailey's client's requests. Mr. Mitchell raised the fact that F. Lee Bailey had a problem that he would like to bring up. He said that Mr. Bailey had a client who had an enormous amount of gold in his possession who would like to make an arrangement with the government whereby the gold could be turned over to the government without the individual being prosecuted for holding the gold. Mr. Mitchell raised the fact... F. Lee Bailey and his group, which consisted of a number of military and ex-military people, had a vast treasure in gold bars located somewhere out on the southwest. In fact, in an area uh, very closely, if not exactly, where the late Milton Noss uh, had made, allegedly, his find. Because of the enormous publicity, the Army finally allowed a group of private claimants, including Babe Noss, F. Lee Bailey's clients, and Airman Burlitt's partner, as well as representatives of the Apache Nation and the alleged heirs of Jesse James, to undertake a 10-day expedition in 1977. Led by professional treasure hunter Norman Scott, his purpose was to determine, once and for all, if treasure really did exist at Victoria Peak. It's sort of the Department of Army policy that there's been a lot of searching up here and we've found nothing yet, or they've found nothing yet, so I don't really expect any particular gold treasure to be found, but I might be quoted incorrectly, too, if they find something. There's no question that gold, like bars, came out of this mountain. No question about it. And in behind, there's paintings down there, behind this shaft. We came here based on legend, research. We are verifying or refuting same by electronic and personal observation. During the expedition, a scientist from the Stanford Research Institute, Lambert Dolphin, conducted ground radar tests to determine if there was an underground chamber deep inside the mountain. But I noticed on the radar screen some uh, echoes quite frequently at a very great depth, 300, 400 feet deep. And that led me to the conclusion that there was indeed a large cavern at the base of the mountain, about where Doc Noss had said there would, was a cavern. Then they came over here and went this, and this is the one that breaks through. Uh, over. Now we're going to take you up to the chimney entrance now. The 1977 expedition was the last official attempt to find the treasure inside Victoria Peak. The crown dock found lies buried, along with other parts of the treasure, somewhere in the New Mexico desert. After Doc's death, his heirs never recovered any of the gold bars. But Tony Jolly, the man who helped him hide the bars in the desert, went back years later and retrieved 10 of them. After more than 50 years of legend, controversy, and intrigue, the heirs of Doc and Babe Noss are still fighting for their rights. And we have decided that we will finish the work that Doc Noss started, that Ova Noss tried to finish, we will eventually get Victoria Peak open so that the mystery of what's inside the peak can be solved. My point of view as governor of New Mexico is this is a solvable mystery. It's always been exciting for us to talk about it. Let's do it right now. It would be interesting to the state, certainly would be interesting to our economy, and we'd have an opportunity to tax these people if they were fortuitous enough to find the gold. If the mountain has not been penetrated and materials removed from this mountain, this will be the biggest thing that this country's ever seen. Babe Noss died in 1979. And every year, her heirs have petitioned the White Sands Missile Base to allow them to dig at Victoria Peak. Every year, the request has been refused. Recently, Terry Delonis took his case to Washington. The Army finally agreed in principle to allow the excavation, but claimed that because of technicalities, an act of Congress would be necessary. This year, a bill will be introduced by New Mexico congressmen, which may finally give the green light. 
If so, an expedition could take place by the end of the year. And if it does, unsolved mysteries will be there. Perhaps we'll find only an empty cavern with evidence of riches long ago removed. But perhaps, just perhaps, we will find the greatest treasure the modern world has ever known. In a moment, the story of a 16-year-old girl who vanished one evening just over 200 yards from her home. What happened to Carrie Lynn Nixon? Osable Forks, population 3,000. Located in the shadows of New York's Adirondack Mountains, Osable Forks is a friendly, family-oriented community. Violent crimes are extremely rare. Indeed, anything out of the ordinary is likely to attract attention. But in 1987, Osable Forks was stunned by the mysterious disappearance of a 16-year-old girl named Carrie Lynn Nixon. Carrie was an above-average student, the pitcher on her high school softball team, hardly the type of girl who would willingly invite trouble. On the evening of June 22, 1987, at approximately 9.30 p.m., Carrie left her home to run an errand for her father. She headed for a neighborhood market a few blocks away. Carrie left the market and headed towards her home. The time was 9.55. As Carrie took the familiar path along Palmer Street to her house, she exchanged greetings with a neighbor. Oh, hi, Carrie. How are you? Good. How are you? Just fine, thank you. The time was now 10.05. At 10.10, a group of boys walked by but saw only an empty street Somehow in the five minutes between 10.05 and 10.10, and just 700 feet from her home, Carrie Lynn Nixon had disappeared. She was innocently walking down the street in a neighborhood that she was born and brought up with, that I was born and brought up on, and something happened. And she wasn't in her bed at 6 in the morning, and my immediate reaction was terror and it's been a nightmare ever since. We began a large air and ground search of the about a 50 mile radius area of around Old Sable Forks, New York. We got, had many volunteers from the local fire departments and the Air Force Base came over. The results of all these searches and all the leads and everything we've done in the last year and a half, nothing has been found, not one thing. She's walked off the face of the earth, as far as we're concerned. Carrie wrote some letters to a friend, and in these letters, she indicated she would like to live in Hawaii, live, move to Florida, possibly California, and in fact, leave the town of Osable Forks when she turned 18. Uh, she expressed this fact two or three times. My theory on this case is Carrie Lynn Nixon was abducted, and she was dressed in sweats, her father gave her $20 for groceries. She went to Thomas's store for her father, paid $3 go, for the groceries, left Thomas's store with the bag of groceries. If she was a runaway, she would have done none of those things. She would have been dressed better. She would have taken money with her that she had in her bedroom after we searched her bedroom. She is a victim of a kidnapping. There was other evidence that the young girl had not run away. Carrie was close to her family, and they often bowled together. Everything pointed to a happy, stable relationship with her mother and father. I'm 100% positive she didn't run away. As far as I'm concerned, somebody pulled up alongside of her. Whether it was somebody she knew, or not necessarily somebody she knew, but one way or the other, somebody picked her up. Was Carrie abducted, or did she run away? By the winter of 1987, the investigation had reached a dead end. But in November, New York State Police received this letter from an anonymous writer in Flint, Michigan. The letter reads, 
Look for Carrie Lynn Nixon in the Utahville, South Carolina area. Despite the tenuous nature of this lead, Carrie's family traveled to Utahville. They blanketed the small town with flyers. The family was as surprised as the police when a local resident remembered having spoken with a 16-year-old who had shyly given her name. It was Carrie Lynn Nixon. Shirley Canapo is a Utahville resident who reported this encounter. She had seen Carrie's picture on one of the flyers posted by the Nixon family. I recognized her immediately from the way she looked because I'd just seen her just about three weeks before that. And her hair, her earrings, and the name, it was the same girl that had been introduced to me, Carrie Lynn Nixon. There have been numerous townspeople around the Utah area that said they've seen this young lady, and like Miss Canapple, she's seen her. She was even introduced to her. And I, I just actually believe 100% that she is still alive. All right, what I want you to do, Shirley, is to relax your body as much as possible, but concentrate on the sound of my voice. Shirley was unable to remember many details of her sighting, so at the request of the New York State Police, she underwent hypnosis. They hoped that her memory might be jogged. You should be feeling very warm, secure, and relaxed. Shirley, I want you to go back to the day that you saw the young girl that we talked about before. It's a hot day. A little red-headed girl comes up and asks me to meet a new friend of hers, Shirley, I want you to meet Carrie Nixon. Carrie Lynn Nixon? Nixon? Where are you from? New York. You down here to stay? Yep. Can you describe her to me? She's got long brown hair. Hey, yep. Where are you staying at? Across the lake. We're at across the lake. Nice. Thanks, Carrie seemed shy, unwilling to offer much conversation beyond her name. Um, what was your first name again? And I said, well, Carrie Lynn Nixon, that is a pretty name. And I walked away from the group. I had worked for about four and a half years in a program where some of our clients were runaways. And you, you pick up on things and the way she evaded the questions, I, I thought then she was a runaway. After the session, authorities investigated the circumstances of Shirley's sighting. They found the girl who was allegedly with Carrie, but were disappointed to discover that she suffered from a memory lapse and couldn't recall the incident. After failing to find any other confirmed sightings of Carrie, the investigation once again reached a dead end. Over a year and a half has passed since Carrie Lynn Nixon vanished. Police have investigated 70 sightings, conducted over 1,500 interviews, and examined over 200 unidentified bodies, and they still have no idea where Carrie Lynn might be today. I love Carrie very much. We just want her back. <clears throat> we just need to know that she's all right. If she has decided that something else is better for her, we, she will have our total support. I just need to know that she's not hurt. I am 100% convinced that I have met you, Carrie. And if I had any message at all to give to you, it would be just call home, call your mom and dad, let them know you're alive. You don't have to go home. Just call and let them know you're alive. Today, Carrie Lynn Nixon would be almost 18 years old. At the time of her disappearance two years ago, she was five feet three inches tall and weighed 105 pounds. Her eyes are blue and her hair is brown. She was known to wear two earrings on her left ear and four on her right. As the years in the investigation dragged on, Carrie's parents began to give up hope of ever finding their daughter. But all that changed in March of this year when they saw a videotape of a concert given by the popular singing group New Kids on the Block. On June 5, 1989, the group filmed their Hangin' Tough Live concert in Los Angeles, California. Let's do it! Among the crowd of teenage fans, Kathy and Gary Nixon saw a familiar face. 
couldn't believe how much that this girl looked like our daughter. So we just kept rewinding it and going over and over and over and we just couldn't believe it because we never really had any hope that she was alive and then this, there's this girl that looks so much like her. I'm not 100% convinced, but it looks like our Carrie. Uh, upon viewing the tape, I picked the girl out immediately the first time it ran through. It was obvious to me uh, that this girl did look like Carrie Nixon and it appeared to be her. This detail-enhanced photograph was made from the videotape and compared with a picture of Carrie taken shortly before she disappeared. There's obviously many similarities. The hair length, the hair color, the shape of the face, the chin, the mouth, and it displayed a multiple of earrings in the right ear, in which Carrie Nixon has four earrings in her right ear and two on her left. So the uh, photo-enhanced finished product further convinced the Nixons that this could be their daughter. Members of the new kids on the block did not recognize the girl in the crowd, but after hearing Carrie's story, wanted to make a personal appeal. Well, I'd just like to say to Carrie that if you're out there, the best thing to do would just be to call somebody and, you know, even if you go to your local police and just, just tell them your situation, that maybe they can help you out. Or if any of you viewers out there who have seen her at a new kid show or just seen her on the street, if you could contact someone, you know, to, to let them know where she is, or if she's all right, or anything, that would be a big help. We need to find this girl, find out who she is, whether it's Carrie or not, just so that if it's not, we can go on to something else to try and find her. I love you, Carrie. And I need to talk to you. Many of us have driven along a lonely stretch of highway. It is an unsettling feeling when you go for miles without seeing other people, when you know that a cry for help would not be heard. We're about to see the story of a man whose worst fears came true. It all began innocently when he said goodbye to his son and set out to drive alone across five sparsely populated states. In the winter of 1985, 68-year-old Dexter Stefanik prepared to drive from his son's Oregon farm to his home in Wisconsin. Six years earlier, Dexter had retired from a Wisconsin paper mill. He had been married for 44 years, but in 1984, his wife Vivian died. A few months later, Dexter went to visit his grandchildren and his son in Corbett, Oregon. But as the first anniversary of Vivian's death approached, Dexter wanted to go back home. He came out and we thought that he'd probably spend the winter with us. And then uh, it got to be a, a, a difficult time of year for him. And I tried to convince him to not leave then. Now with your mother gone, you know I'm gonna be out here to see you as often as possible. I had a good time, but I, I've got to go back. Winter was already set in. There was really nothing he needed to go back to Wisconsin for. We discussed that even if he got partway home and decided to come back out, that was fine, turn around and come back out again. He was anxious to get home. And he drove away. That's the last I saw him. Dexter Stefanik left his son's home in Oregon on the morning of November the 18th, 1985. Dexter had made the 2,000-mile trip from Oregon to Wisconsin many times before. Because he wanted to finish the drive as quickly as possible, he told his son he would not stop at motels, but would pull into rest areas instead. November the 19th, 1985. On a bleak stretch of Montana Highway, at the Bad Route rest area, a burning car was found. When I arrived at the rest area and pulled in behind the vehicle, uh, the inside was completely engulfed in flames. I went over and talked to the State Highway Department 
Uh, they informed me they didn't see any, any person inside the vehicle. A computer check of the license plates revealed that the car belonged to Dexter Stefanik of Rhinelander, Wisconsin. It was only 26 hours after Dexter had left his son's home in Oregon. The sheriff's department immediately searched the area, worried that Dexter might have begun walking for help and been overcome by the bitter cold. They found nothing. Yeah, we're getting some uh, uh, good indications in here. Sheriff Jim George had an arson expert examine the car. He found that the fire had been set deliberately using gasoline. Sheriff George also noticed that the driver's seat was pushed all the way back. Dexter Stefanik, being a short man, would have had to have the seat all the way up to the front to drive it. So it had to be a larger man driving that vehicle, six feet or larger. Law enforcement officials were stymied. Who was the six foot tall man who had driven Dexter Stefanik's car? Could this person have set fire to the car? Finally, where was Dexter? Had he been killed or had he simply disappeared into the harsh Montana winter? Sheriff George attempted to establish the chronology of events from the morning that Dexter's car had been burned. His car had been discovered just after 10 a.m. Nearly three hours earlier, Fred Sigley, custodian of the Bad Route rest area, had arrived for work as usual. I got to the rest area between 8 and 8.30. There was a pickup park there, and there was nobody around. I really didn't pay no attention to it. About 15 minutes later, at 8.45 a.m., Clyde Mitchell, a Montana Highway Maintenance Supervisor, made a stop at the rest area. Fred's pickup was there, and the white Chevy pickup facing southeast. Went into the utility room and talked to Fred and asked Fred if he had seen anybody or how long the pickup had been there. And he didn't know how long it had been there. So then I took a closer look of it. I saw Arizona plates in the back, walked around the complete outfit and noticed it was a four-wheel drive Chevy with blue trim and a cow catcher on the front. At the time, I didn't think there was anything suspicious about it. At approximately 9.15 a.m., Clyde left to complete his regular rounds. Fifteen minutes later, at 9.30 a.m., as Fred Sigley was leaving the rest area, Dexter Stefanik's Brown Plymouth Horizon pulled in. The driver got out carrying two large plastic containers. Do you have any problems? No, I just run out of gas and I had to go get some. Yeah, he was around six feet tall, between 35 and 40 years old. He's real light complected and he's clean shaved. No sign of anything wrong with him. No, there was nothing unusual about him. He didn't seem to be excited or nothing. The authorities had no idea who the man was or what had happened to Dexter. Less than a half hour after Fred Sigley saw the man at the rest area, Dexter's car was discovered there in flames. Nearly four months later, a local couple, Bill and Cindy Shaw, went to a remote landfill 17 miles from the Bad Route rest area. My husband and I came out to dump some garbage, and there was a wallet laying on the ground. And it still had the driver's license in it. It was current. Found a wallet. So I handed it to Bill, and, and he looked at it, and he wondered if it belonged to the man whose car burned up at the rest area a few months before. And later, we, ju we just started looking around, and there was a bunch of stuff in the dump that didn't belong there, that hadn't been there when we were there before. And we each kind of went our own direction, trying to see if there was anything else that didn't quite belong in the dump. Boy, a shaving kit, a suitcase. The boot over here is practically new. Both Cindy and her husband, Bill, found several pieces of men's clothing. Bill picked up a boot, and when he stood up, saw a man's foot partially Cindy, hidden beneath a mattress. Bill and Cindy called the authorities. The coroner positively identified the body as Dexter Stefanik and said that he had been shot twice in the head. There were marks on his hands. There was damage done to his neck and throat area. And he had a bruise or damaged area on the frontal part of his skull that was probably caused by a beating or 
some type of injury of that sort. Sheriff's investigators discovered that there was money in Dexter's suitcase, so robbery seemed an unlikely motive. Also, the clothing which had been conspicuously placed around the landfill belonged to Dexter and appeared to have been placed there just days before it was found. The things that we found that day were just not things that had been here before, and it really bothered me that the week before, everything was normal, and seven days later, all of this stuff appeared. Strangely, Dexter Stefanik's body seemed to have been in the landfill for several months. The condition of the body would indicate that it had, had probably been in the dump site from the time uh, that the car was found burning until the time it was discovered. I have no reason to believe that it wasn't. Okay, Jim, let's look around and see if we can find anything. One week later, the authorities found one final clue a small line of graffiti written in pencil in the Bad Route Rest Area Men's Room. Hey, Tim, look at this. It began with the words, Hot Jock, and other keywords seemed to refer to Dexter Stefanik's murder. Hot Jock from Wisconsin, 1185. My own theory is that someone wanted us to see it. Hot Jock could be a CB handle. Uh, it referred to shot. It had the Wisconsin written in the, the graffiti and a date indicating November. Sheriff George believes the graffiti was written by the killer. I think he was telling law enforcement something. I think he was taunting law enforcement or bragging to law enforcement about committing a homicide. The sheriff has attempted to reconstruct Dexter Stefanik's last hours. He believes that Dexter arrived at the Bad Route rest area soon after 7 a.m. on November the 19th, and that his murderer was already there. Dexter was hard of hearing. It is a sheriff's theory that the killer tried to get his attention and failed. Sir, could you help me? I've run out of gas. Could you take me to town and get some gas? What's your problem? Get out of the car! Get out of the car! It is unclear at what Get point Dexter Stefanik was actually killed, Get but it. the authorities are convinced that the mysterious murderer abducted Dexter and, after killing him, hid his body in the landfill. Sheriff George believes that the murderer returned to the rest area, doused Dexter's car with gasoline, and set it on fire, both to destroy evidence and to distract officials so he would have time to escape. Dexter Stefanik's killer is still at large. Only two clues exist, the description of the suspect's vehicle and the sketchy description of the suspect himself. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. Thank you.